Oral comments on the proposed construction permit for Sunshine Industries Ready Mix Concrete Batch Plant. Copies of the draft construction permit, the statement of basis, and a dust control plan have been made available for review and comment on the district's proposed actions web page. I know many of you may have attended or watched last week's planning commission meeting, so I want to highlight some important differences between that proceeding and tonight. First, the district's permitting process provides notice to the public, an opportunity for public comment, and a hearing for oral comments when a hearing is requested. The public comment period on the proposed draft construction permit for Sunshine Industries began on October 6th and ends tomorrow, November the 11th. Tonight's public hearing is being held both in person and online via video teleconference. Second, I'd like to thank Steve Sullivan, Vice, Vice Chair of the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board, and our other board members who are joining us tonight for hosting this meeting. The board's role is to be sure that tonight's public, heating, public hearing meets the standards for such proceedings. The district's role tonight is to hear from you. The reason is that the district not the board, is the decision maker on issuing permits. Procedures at the district's public hearing will follow KRS Chapter 77 and the district's regulations and will include a brief summary of the proposed permit by the district and comments, if any, from the applicant. Oral comments from those wishing to speak will follow. At the conclusion of the oral comments, the public hearing will be adjourned. Importantly, Unlike the Planning Commission's public meeting where they may hear a case, take testimony, deliberate, and take final action, there is no discussion of the comments at the district's public hearing or any deliberation on the merits of the proposed action. Instead, all comments, whether in writing, in person, or online via video teleconference, will be compiled and responded to in a written response to comment document that will be shared when the final dis permit decision is made. It's also important to note that although our permitting process, that through the permitting process, the district determines only whether an applicant can meet air pollution regulations, and if so, writes and issues a permit that properly enforces those regulations. As such, public comments may impact the final permit by pointing out laws and regulations that may have been misapplied, technical errors, or case-by-case -case decisions that are not sufficient, including monitoring record keeping or emissions testing requirements. The district cannot deny an application that meets air pollution laws and regulations or consider comments that request any action outside of its regulatory authority. Finally, I'd like to thank the district's industrial permitting staff for their work on this permit and staff from across the agency for setting up and assisting with tonight's public hearing and our earlier policy committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hamilton. This public meeting held by the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board is called to order and is being held pursuant to KRS Chapter 77 and district regulations. Notice of this hearing has been published pursuant to state law. This public hearing is being offered via video teleconference due to the COVID-19 outbreak. This hearing is being recorded. The purpose of this hearing is for the district to hear comments from the public on this permit. The board's role in this hearing is to host the hearing and the district's role is to respond to comments and make a final decision on the permitting action. If you would like to make a comment here in person, Please fill out a speaker card. Instructions on making oral comments via video teleconference have been included as part of the materials posted on the district's website for this public hearing. As a brief reminder, please raise your hand via video teleconference by clicking on the raise hand button next to your name in the participants list, or if you are joining by phone, um, uh, by pressing star three and you will be called on. Substantive comments submitted today in the chat will also be included in the, in the record as written comments. If you are here in person, you will be called to the microphone. We will alternate speakers online and in person. 
Oral comments must be presented today. Comments must be concise. All comments will become a part of the hearing record. You will be allowed three minutes to speak. Please note our time here at the front of the room who will give you a signal right here. When you have one minute remaining and another when your time has expired. If you would like to make additional comments, we encourage you to submit them to air permits at louisvilleky.gov. This hearing is being held for the construction permit for Sunrise Industries Ready Mix located at 13905 Aiken Road. The purpose of this hearing today is to collect written and oral comments for the district's consideration before making a final de decision on, construct on the construction permit for Sunrise Industries Ready Mix. All public hearings are conducted in an orderly manner and will be recessed if members of the audience are disruptive. The proceedings today are being recorded in accordance with District Regulation 2.07. We have an assistant county attorney here to ensure we are following all public hearing requirements. Please note that today's hearing is a hybrid event that includes members of the audience joining virtually. As such, we ask that you direct your comments into the microphone to ensure you uh, are audible and to those online and in our recording of the hearing, which we use to help us respond to your comments. If there is any time that there are no comments being taken, the hearing may be paused to allow others to join the hearing. After this hearing, if you have provided an email address on the sign-in sheet, you will be notified by email of the district permit decision and availability of the district's comment and response document which describes any changes to the permit from the draft to the final and contains written responses to questions and comments raised at the hearing and provided within the comment period. This document will also be posted on the district's website under recent actions and available upon request. Matt King will provide a brief description of the district's permitting program. Thank, Thank you, Vice Chair Sullivan. Good evening, my name is Matt King. I'm the industrial permitting manager for the district. I'm gonna provide a brief description today about the district's permitting program and how public comments are considered in making the final permit decisions. The Sunshine Industries Concrete Batch Plant is a FEDUP source. FEDUP stands for Federally Enforceable District Origin Operating Permit. FEDUP permits are an option for all potentially major sources that because of air pollution control devices and or limited utilization are able to limit emissions to less than the major source threshold. In general, they are the middle size facilities between true minor sources and major sources we often refer to as Title V. An opportunity for hearing is provided for any permit for which there is significant public concern. This construction permit contains all monitoring, record keeping and reporting requirements in addition to all applicable standards. The federally enforceable portion of this permit is the 25 ton per year limits for particulate matter that preclude the facility from exceeding the major source threshold of 100 tons per year. The 25 ton limit also establishes this facility as a star exempt facility, that is the Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Program. Although there are several true minor source batch plants in Louisville, the majority of other batch plants are also categorized as FEDUPs. The district is required to consider public comment as part of our permitting decisions. Comments from the public that can be incorporated into permit decisions are welcome. Relevant comments may include specific statements about the permit application and the proposed permit or information indicating the operation of the facility poses a threat to human health or the environment. That it could also raise issues with the district's review process or procedures. And lastly, express concerns that the issuance of the permit would cause violations of the district regulations or the Clean Air Act. Issues that are beyond the scope of the district's permitting authority, such as property values, zoning issues, or issues that are the responsibility of other governmental bodies, not the district, are not considered in making the final permit decision. After the hearing and public comment period are complete, the district will review all comments. The district will make uh, any appropriate changes to the permit. Once a final determination is made, the permit response to comments document will be posted on our recent actions page and sent to anyone who commented and provided their contact information. I wanna thank everybody for coming out. Thank the two board members who are joining us and the staff that's helped with this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Shannon Hosey will provide a brief description of the proposed construction permit. Ms. Hosey. 
Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shannon Hothi, and I am the environmental engineer in the permitting section with the district. I am going to briefly describe the proposed construction permit for Sunshine Industries. I'm trying to share my screen. There it is. All right, there we go. The district received a construction application in June to build a concrete batch plant. Here is the process flow diagram. This diagram is included in the handout. This is a concrete batch plant and not a cement manufacturing plant. Concrete from this facility is composed of cement, cement supplement, sand, gravel, and stone. Once each raw material is transferred, it is fed by gravity to weigh hoppers, which combine the proper amounts of each material based on client specifications. Then it's gravity fed into mixer trucks and transported. The cement and cement supplement unloading, weigh hopper loading, and truck loading are all controlled by dust collectors. This shows the potential emissions from this project. These emissions are included in the handout. The total PM10 potential emissions are 6.2 tons per year. The ones highlighted are controlled. The company has accepted a 25 ton per year limit for PM10 to be a star exempt feed source. This shows the PM pound per hour limits and what equipment must be controlled to meet the limits, which are highlighted in green. This is also included in the handout. Emission points E3, E4, E9, and E11, which include the cement and supplement unloading to the silos, cement and supplement hopper, and truck loading must be controlled at all times. The dust collectors for cement and cement unloading have a control efficiency of 99.9%, weight hopper loading is 99.5%, and truck loading is 99.8%. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hosey. Would a representative of Sunshine Ready Mix like to make a statement? Please raise your hand via video teleconference in by clicking on the raise hand button next to your name in the participants list or joining by phone by pressing star three and we'll be called upon. Please tell your name and title when you begin speaking. Do we have a representative either online or in person? Does anyone from the public wish to make a comment? Please raise your hand via video teleconference by clicking on the raise hand button next to your name in the participants list or by joining or if you are joined by phone by pressing star three and you will be called upon. Please tell us your name and organization you may be representing, if any, when you begin speaking. Again, we will alternate between persons in present and online. Randy Strobo. Good evening. My name is Randy Strobo. I represent the Lake Forest Community Association, which essentially is the homeowners association for the Lake Forest community. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, David Spinard, and our expert, Dr. Cole Burkamp. He's an epidemiologist at the University of Cincinnati. And Dr. Scott Simonton, I think, is online right now. He is an environmental engineer at Marshall University. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, um, Ms. Hamilton, Mr. King, Board and staff, you all have been very helpful and very accommodating to my client and their members and very patient uh, with answering their questions. And we, we really appreciate the uh, transparency and the response rate that you all have given them. So we've, we've submitted written comments um, along with two initial expert reports from Dr. Brokamp and from Dr. Simonton. Dr. Brokamp's is located at Exhibit 1. Dr. Simonton's is at Exhibit 2. Um, regardless, our client has still asked us to come here tonight uh, to emphasize three main points in those comments. Um, we also look forward to your responses to those comments when you all are ready to um, send those out. So number one, the location of this concrete uh, batch plan is obviously the big issue here. It's very close to many homes, the residents of Lake Forest, a church, an elementary school, an adult learning facility. Lake Forest has over 1,700 homes, 7,000 residents, and the property boundary to the facility is located less than 80 feet away from the nearest home. As number two, as Dr. Brokamp will speak about in a few minutes, um, and as reflected in his Exhibit 1 report, um, the draft permit as written will still allow for a significant amount of PM and ultra-fine particulate emissions, ultra-fine particulates included in particulates, uh, particulate matter, but often not really talked about. And certainly the draft permit doesn't mention those as well. The facility will have a hyperlocal public health impact from those PM and UFP emissions 
including on Lake Forest residents, the attendees of the schools and the church, and especially those uh, folks that are uh, part of more vulnerable populations. Number three, um, again, uh, the biggest flaw of the facility is location, but as Dr. Simonton has stated in his report, as are two engineers from Lake Forest, Steve and Charlie to my left, who will be testifying later, um, there are, um, well, the applicant could do much more to ensure that emissions will be reduced and better controlled. This includes requiring continuous automated monitors that are much more protective of the public rather than once a day visual checks. So in sum, the proposed, the, sorry, the proposed facility is located too close to the residents and students and we feel the facility as demonstrated by its application and draft permit will not protect a considerable number of persons from injury, detriment, nuisance, or annoyance, and will endanger the comfort, health, or safety of those folks and the rest of the public. We urge you to not approve the permit, and we welcome any questions. Thank you. Online, we have William Clinton. Mr. Clinton, I will unmute you now and make you a panelist. If you are able, you're welcome to turn on your video as well. Are you able to hear us, Mr. Clinton? You are unmuted now. Oh, Clifton, I'm sorry. Mr. Clifton, that might be why you are responding. Mr. Clifton, if you're able to hear us, you're unmuted and you're welcome to speak. We'll move on to in-person, we'll try again at the end. Steve Plass. Okay, good evening. My name is Steve Plass, and uh, I don't represent anyone other than, I guess, myself. I am a resident of the Lake Forest uh, area. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the board for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, and uh, I, I come to the board as, as I'm a chemical engineer, I graduated from the University of Cincinnati in 1982, and uh, I spent 35 years working for a large consumer product company. Um, I still consult in the dry material handling business, and over that past portion of 35 years, um, I have been in dust collectors, I've helped design dust collectors, I've repaired dust collectors, I've done many, many things um, with dust collectors. Um, so, as was mentioned earlier, um, it seems like there's a high probability that this concrete plant will be built. And so in my mind, it, the attention has to focus on how do we make the plant safe and how do we make that reliable? And I think that is probably everybody in this room's goal. Um, and so that is where my thought process goes to. So when I look at two of the specific permit applications, um, 100H and 100J, both of those, um, permit applications mention manual monitoring type equipment. So the observations are visual um, and they lack sophistication um, from what I would consider good engineering practice um, for monitoring. And so what I'm asking for specifically is that the, um, the differential pressure transmitters or the differential pressure gauges that I think are on those dust collectors be changed to differential pressure transmitters. Differential pressure transmitters will allow for continuous monitoring. Um, and given the sophistication of the control system that's been talked about, these um, differential pressure transmitters can go to a historian. Those values can be recorded and normal operating alarm conditions and shutdown conditions can be established. So when we properly control those dust collectors, we have the greatest potential to eliminate the risk to the subdivision. So I would ask that those specific forms be modified to reflect differential pressure transmitters. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Dries or Dries, I will make you a panelist and unmute you. You are welcome to turn on your video if able. You're unmuted whenever you are ready. 
Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm very concerned with the health aspect of this facility on our communities, the babies, the children, the grandparents who live close by. What I think we need, but I know this will check all your boxes, but what I think we really need right now is a thorough health report. We have a letter from a pulmonologist who has told his patient who lives close by that if this is built, he will have to be moved. He will have to move. He cannot live in the vicinity. And also tonight, I'll forward a report that was completed by Dr. Christopher North in April of this year. He's a medical doctor of occupational medicine in Fisher, Indiana. He lives in, in the community that had planned a, a concrete batch plant just like this, real close to the residents. And what he has said is that research has been conducted by Harvard School of Public Health, and they found a clear link be between the exposure to fine particles and premature death from heart and lung disease. What we heard from the applicant was his civil engineer, not a doctor, said there'd be a low uh, chance of cancer. But what's more particular is lung diseases. Fine particles such as PM 2.5 are also known to worsen chronic diseases like asthma, cardiovascular disease, bronchitis, and other respiratory problems such as COPD. Well, what is P, uh, PM 2.5? It's about um, less than 2.5 micrometers, which is about 2% of the size, the diameter of the size of a hair follicle. So think of that, a hair. Think how small this, poly this particle is. Since there's such a small size, fine particles tend to remain longer in the air than heavier particles. This increases the likelihood to humans and, and animals um, inhaling them in their bodies. And since there's such a small size, they're able to bypass the nose protection and the throat protection goes straight into the lungs. And where do you find these PM 2.5 particles? Various sources, including concrete batching facilities. All right, that's the Harvard study. Then we have a study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association that shows that long-term exposure to PM 2.5 may result in vascular inflammation leading to plaque formulation, which can eventually lead to a heart attack and stroke. Yeah, one okay. minute left. I, okay, and I, I don't care how, how good the filters are, there's going to be fugitive dust escaping from this. All right, you'll be able to check the file. Like I said, I'll, I'll submit this report. Also, the American Heart Association has found the same thing. And then there's been numerous studies on adverse pregnancy outcomes. John Hopkins University has said this particulate matter tends to develop asthma and need emergency room and hospital treatment. So if you notice some of the opposition letters, there's many people in the neighborhood and around our whole community that have pulmonary issues, they have uh, lung issues, they have asthma, they have allergies. And I know each of you all got on this board in, in your position to keep our community safe. The fugitive dust associated with the concrete plant should not be located immediately upwind of a major residential neighborhood. This is a terrible location for a concrete plant. Please right, make sure up? there is a thorough health safety study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cole, Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cole Burkamp. I'm a faculty member at University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati Children's. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I lead um, NIH uh, National Institute of Health grants on the effects of particulate matter on adolescents and kids. Um, and I'm here to talk today about particulate matter and the adverse effects that we can expect on population um, if, this, if this amount of pollution is approved. Um, so I'm glad to hear about particulate matter being talked about in different size fractions. That's something really important to consider, of course, um, the fine and the ultra fine. Um, and as we just heard, the ultra fine and fine are the most dangerous because they can penetrate deeply in the lungs and, and get into the bloodstream. Um, and, and we know that this is not specific to um, cement production, but actual concrete batching. Um, you know, overall, there's over 300 billion um, estimated damages and health effects from concrete production worldwide. 
and uh, batching concrete specifically just, uh, represents about 20% of those lost years of life. Um, so the proposed limit uh, greatly exceeds other industrial sources. Um, I pulled a lot of sources that are reported to the National Emissions Inventory, so showing other plants like the Ford plant and other smaller plants within 5,000 meters of the proposed location. Um, and, and you'll see in my report that the proposed emissions really dwarf by orders of magnitude anything else that's happening. Um, so lastly, you know, I, I wanted to make the point that we will see hyperlocal increases in particulate matter. Um, scientific studies and observational real world studies have shown that um, ultra fine, fine, and coarse particulate matter are increased, you know, orders of magnitude, hundreds of times higher um, within, you know, less than a thousand meters from this proposed site. So, you know, no level of air pollution is safe, of course. Um, but even short single days of high air pollution um, can cause inflammation in the lungs um, associated uh, with the risk of um, increased hospital admissions for cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, and other rare diseases. Um, you know, more recently, the scientific community has uh, uncovered the association between a particular matter and mental health. Um, and we see an increase of kids uh, attempting suicide and coming to the hospital for anxiety and depression problems on high air pollution days. Um, Long-term exposure to PM 2.5, you know, obviously increases all-cause all mortality, but is also responsible for increased preterm birth, low birth weight, increases cardiovascular, respiratory, psychiatric um, disease, um, causes increased incidence of cancer, including lung, oral, rectal, liver, skin, breast, and kidney cancers. Um, so in summary, I believe that, you know, the proposed facility will emit enough um, emissions to adversely impact, you know, the students um, and the residents nearby. I'm going to ask you guys to consider uh, the Stouffer Elementary School, the St. Mary's Center, the residences that are very close, very close by, um, and, and think of studies that have shown that students are testing worse and students are having more asthma um, if they are just in the right downwind direction from a, um, a, a batch facility such as this. Thank you. Next up online, we have Emily Smith. Ms. Smith, you are unmuted now. If you're able, you can turn on your video. Thank you. One second, Ms. Smith. I think we both unmuted you and I ended up re-muting. If you're unmuted now. Oh, my apologies. Um, my name is Chanel Smith. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. Uh, my, I'm the legislative assistant to Councilman Piagentini. He happens to be at the Metro Council meeting this evening and the flu has struck my home. So I did not want to pass germs to all you lovely people. So I am virtual tonight. So I'm here to read uh, a letter on behalf of the councilman and the residents. So this letter is from him to the Air Pollution Control Board. Dear members of the Air Pollution Control Board, I apologize for my inability to attend the meeting tonight, but I'm at a Metro Council meeting where we are voting on many key issues and I want to ensure my constituents are also represented on those issues through my debate and votes. In my absence, I have asked my legislative aide to read this statement about my thoughts on this process and my ask to partner with my and my ask to partner with my office if this concrete branch batch plant is an ultimately built. First, I would like to address some concerns I have with the process tonight. I'm very happy the APCD has a process to create a night meeting allowing a more thorough public examination of the permit when there is public interest. Where I'm a concern is the implementation of the meeting, including the fact that it is, isn't conducted in a geographic area impacted by the air applicant. Although you include an online option to attend this meeting, it is not a substitute for being available and access to the public in that live format. This is one of the bedrocks being acceptable to the public. Public officials should be accessible, especially when it's related to sensitive matters. I offer the assistance in my office to secure a location in District 19 that would accommodate the public attendees and fulfill your operational and technical requirements. I'm disappointed that this offer was not accepted and the meeting is being conducted at a significant distance from the impacted public, creating an unnecessary hardship for those who wanted their concerns addressed. I'm asking that in the future you amend your rules to stimulate, stipulate that evening meetings like this rel related to specific applicants are conducted in venues as close to the subject property as possible so that most affected members are able to attend live. Next, I would Smith, like to ask. One minute. One minute. Okay. Randy. Next, I would like to ask the APCD to help my office conduct research into concerns with the proximity of the certain light and heavy industrial land uses to residential areas. We have. Uh, demonstrable problems in the west end of the city with residential homes in very close proximity to heavy industrial 
which has created many adverse health outcomes for the local residents. The city has not properly created local legislation to address this issue. I have my staff currently researching buffer zone, which resident land restrict land developments using regardless of the zoning when it is close proximity to residential area. I would truly appreciate the APCD's assistance and any research that can inform us on what land development uses created the greatest risk for residential areas. Finally, I do want to express my desire to partner in creating an approximate appropriate monitoring station downwind of this property to ensure the local residential areas and the local public school and not adversely affect it. I have had a brief discussion with Rebecca Hamilton about this and I appreciate her thoughts. I request that the APCD partner with my office to identify the best monitoring device and then we can discuss payment for that device through a combination of grants and access to other city fund sources. I would like to have please, that device installed at the same time to new plant comes along and the monitoring changes in the air. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robin Anderson. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robin Anderson and I'm a resident of Lake Forest. Um, I'm coming here to talk to you tonight about some of the toxins. Um, I already have lung issues and after several CTs, x-rays and PET scans, numerous doctor visits, blood work, I'm here to discuss some of the harmful issues with the concrete batch plant. Um, first of all, the permit on there allows 8,760 hours per year, which is basically 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Um, according to Dr. Latrice Babin, director of the Harris County Pollution Control, volatile organic compound is a problem. This can irritate eyes, respiratory system, cause shortness of breath, headache, fatigue, skin problems, and impaired memory. The Environmental Defense Fund states living near these, you're exposed to higher levels of harmful pollutions. And according to the American Lung Association, types of pollution referred to as particulate matter, basically any small particles can cause increased heart disease, lung cancer, and asthma. Particulate matter is linked to serious health conditions um, including reduced lung development in children, higher rates of asthma, bronchitis, heart disease, and cancer. The concrete batch plant has equipment that it combines various ingredients, including sand, aerogate, fly ash, which is a product of burning coal containing carcinogens and heavy metals, silica fume, which can cause silicosis in lungs after exposure, slag, admixtures, and concrete. Increased air pollution will potentially emit PM10s, which we've discussed different um, um, diameters, are particles defined by their microns um, or less are inhalable to the lungs and can induce adverse health effects. Um, small, small particles can stay in the air for 12 days. Concentrations of these PM10s can result in a number of health issues ranging from coughing, wheezing to asthma, attacks, bronchitis, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, and premature death. Some of the issues that are generated from dust are of the, of the dry concrete and stockpiles of sand aggregate are the transport and transfer of materials, spills, and dust by vehicle movement. Other issues are water, contaminating the water, sand, potential petroleum products, and where does the excess concrete go? Uh, you have diesel trucks frequently idling, more air pollutants, carbon monoxide. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Next up online, we have Grant Geary. Mr. Geary, you are unmuted. If you're able, feel free to turn on your camera. Hi, thank you guys for the opportunity to speak and for holding this meeting tonight. Um, I just wanted to start off and say that I am a, Lake For uh, a resident of Lake Forest as well. I am a tier one resident um, according to zoning and planning, which means that my house will be within 500 feet of the plant. 
Um, my wife and I moved in October of 2021, and had we known that this plant had been um, in the works, we would not have moved. Um, specifically, we moved with a four-month-old. We moved to the Lake Forest neighborhood to um, <clears throat> be able to use the um, the life. I, I, I don't mean mean lifestyle, but um, to engage with the community. Um, we moved into a cul-de-sac that has 10 kids under the age of 10. Um, we're constantly outside enjoying each other's time and, and having our kids be able to play with each other. There's numerous parks in the neighborhood as well as um, pools as well that we tried to, we moved to the neighborhood to be able to make use of. Um, so part of our, our um, frustration now is that we will not be able to do the things outside that we have um, come accustomed to. Um, my son was born with um, a breathing issue. He wasn't breathing when he was born. He had pneumonia. He was on breathing treatments. We were in the NICU for seven days, and he recently was diagnosed with asthma. So just to piggyback on top of some of the other issues that, that are arising here, I think a major concern that you guys need to really consider when making your decision is the concern and impact to the actual people that are going to be living um, within the vicinity of this. Um, my son won't be able to go outside at all um, because of his asthma. And because of his his compromised uh, um, lung situation and breathing situation, um, he is he is on a nebulizer as needed, um, as well as a couple other asthma or excuse me allergy issues. Um, so I just really want you guys to um, take your time with making your decision and really pay attention to the fact that you know that this this 25, 25 tons of of particulate matter um, per year is not safe for a child. It's not safe for the elderly. It's really not safe sure, for anybody. Yeah, then you think of the fact that you've got this Stouffer Elementary School that, uh, as a crow flies, is about 0.49 miles from the proposed plant location. I just really want you guys to to think about these things and not just from the lines of, oh well, if their their application says that they're going to do what they're going to do, um, then we have to approve it. You know, I think be a human, take a look into this from from an aspect other than just point blank, black and white, what's on paper, um, and just really keep that in consideration when you all are making your decision on whether to approve this 24 hour operation or not, um, in which the applicant has already told us that he would not set a specific hour of operations. So keep that in mind. Thank you guys again for your time. Thank you. Kimber. My name is Tim Bird, and I'm the neighbor of Grant Berry and uh, several other people in the cul-de-sac, just a couple hundred yards from where the plant's going to be built. Um, you all have the numbers you've gone through and had engineers give you the specific numbers of particulate matter that the plant itself is going to generate. I have several concerns about axillary things to the plant, some of which are not under the uh, purveyance of this board safety traffic, that type of thing. However, the additional truck traffic that's going to be through there is going to produce a tremendous amount of pollution. And it's going to be closer than just in the plant premises itself. You're going to have anywhere from 25 to 50 to maybe even 150 truck operations a day, not just the 10 brand new concrete plant or the concrete trucks that uh, Mr. Garrett has purchased that won't remain new forever. But you're going to have a lot of dump trucks, a lot of other trucks coming in, supplying, going back and forth. Forget the safety issues from traffic and kids playing and this type of thing, just from a narrow road and the like. But the additional emissions that all of this traffic which cannot be regulated by the EPA, which cannot be regulated by the Air Pollution Control Board. Um, and right now there are no monitoring stations out there, but they're going to operate where they're going to operate because all of the roads out there are public roads and nobody, unless you have a police officer out there to police it and give them fines for operating on roads, they can drive right through Lake Forest. It doesn't matter what the binding elements say or what the plan is. The plan is make the schedule work and make the profit. And I ask you all to take a look not only at the emissions from the plant itself, but all of the other 
um, emissions that are going to come as a result, not from the plant, but because of the plant. Thank you. Thank you. We have no other hands raised virtually right now. If you'd like to speak, if you're virtual and haven't yet, you can find your raised hand function next to your name in the attendee list. Joseph Nance. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, some of you are actually familiar faces. You guys were kind enough to join us at a separate uh, event. You've also joined us at our lake, uh, our lodge, if you will, for our HOA. So I want to thank you guys for that as well. Um, I, along with a number of other residents, actually live in direct proximity of where this plant is being proposed. My child and children, along with the neighbor's children, are all under the age of 10 years old. You've heard a doctor present and have, have case studies that this particular matter is very detrimental. I've heard from both sides where they're going to use state of the art to be able to do all this. Well, guess what? DuPont paint was state of the art. How long was that around? We didn't have cigarette warnings forever. All this information and all this research and data has been out there for a very long time that's saying that this is not healthy for anybody. This doesn't just apply to my neighborhood, this applies all over Kentucky. I'm not asking just for my neighborhood, I'm asking for all of Louisville. This does not need to happen anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, gonna give Mr. Clifton another try. Uh, William Clifton, I'm going to approach you and try unmuting you again. You are welcome to make a statement if you're able again. Mr. Clifton, I'm sorry, if you're speaking, we are unable to hear you. Give it one more moment. No luck, sorry. Dane Mattingly? Hey, everybody, and thanks as for having us here and everything you all do. Um, I just want to reiterate everything they said. I'm not a doctor. I don't, I don't know all that kind of things, like what it does to the body. But hearing that and knowing I have a six-year-old little girl and, like, all of our neighbors have little kids to just crawl around the neighborhood every single day in the wind pattern. Like, I don't know how much you all do with wind patterns and doctors using third-party comfort. Uh, companies, but the wind patterns, like just from them moving dirt around, like are every, not every day, but on a lot of days you will come out and it's just like a fog of just dirt. And then you look at your cars and your, like your windows, it's all covered with stuff. So how can the, like, I know they're containing, but 25 tons of that, that cancerous dust that's coming just guaranteed, like every day we're outside, the wind, they're sitting up on a hill. The neighborhood goes down a hill. So everything up there comes down. Like we used to joke with our neighbors that lived uphill, they when their leaves would fall every year, they would kind of they would wait a little bit because they're that's where their leaves blow down the hill. Like so it's just natural that all that cancerous dust is going to fall on our kids. Like, please just put yourself in our position. Like I know y'all have kids or grandkids or kids you love just it's just it's heartbreaking to know like grant said I'm like he can't even take it he just moved into this house he can't take his kid outside if this plant's built imagine like you all moving into a house with a newborn baby and you look outside and there's a new concrete plant now your family's stuck inside like that's how we're all going to be like hundreds of families i know we're closest so we're the ones that are fighting a lot of people down on the hill and the, the neighborhood, they don't know that it's all coming their way because it is like it's it's the wind pattern. So please, I don't know if you all take that into consideration, but please hire a, a before you make this decision, look into the wind patterns of everything up there blowing hard downhill because it does. And the doctors listen to the, their concerns because it's out of my realm. But thank you all for everything you do. Sorry you're put in this position. But we need you all to protect us. Thank you. Thank you. 
We still have no raised hands virtually, but we've had a couple of attendees add. So if you're new to the meeting virtually, you can raise your hand next to your name in the attendee list if you would like to make a comment. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go back to in person. Ross Cowson. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time tonight. Um, everything I was going to talk about has basically been touched upon, so I've basically thrown everybody, everything out. Um, but one thing that I did want to talk about doing all the research is I came across something from the National Cancer Institute, uh, the Division of Cancer and Epidemiology and Genetics, uh, talking about outdoor ultrafine particulate matter and lung cancer risk. The International Agency of Research on Cancer, the IARC, has classified ambient outdoor particulate matter as a group one human carcinogen. I didn't know what that was, so I did some further research. I actually went to their website, and they define a group one a human carcinogen as an, a carcinogen to humans. There is enough evidence to conclude that it can cause cancer in humans. Uh, everything else has been touched upon. Um, one thing that, that was um, talked about last week at the Planning and Zoning uh, Committee meeting uh, was a STARS study. Um, doing research, I can't find a STAR study anywhere. Um, Mr. Talbot's kind of hanging his hat on that. What I did find is a Dr. Thomas Starr's testimony um, in front of the Senate hearing committee uh, in about 25 years ago. Um, and he didn't do any research. He basically just did a meta-analysis of the research. Uh, there were some laws changing for the EPA um, that he was a little bit against, and he was basically saying, like, more research needs to be done on this. From what I could tell, from my understanding, is he was arguing against particulate matter and disease from research done in 1965. Things have changed since then. So much more research has gone since then. So I don't know this study. I can't find this study. But this, if they're hanging their hat on that, that testimony should be null and void right now. That shouldn't even be a part of it. There is so much research. The Lung Association, the EPA, the CDC, World Health Organization, it's there. The research is there. Um, and we're not the only one. We're not dealing with it right now, but there are other communities that are already dealing with it. I mean, I found an article about the Butchertown neighborhood right close to the um, to the soccer stadium is actually dealing with this. They're talking about the dust being everywhere. They can't go outside. They can't grow vegetables. They're talking about the health risks, the health changes that they're already finding, swollen glands. And, and children that are having issues. So this is already there. The research is there. I have no idea. I'm naive about this, about what you guys do and how you guys handle this. But if you have any possibility to say, like, hey, we cannot pass this, please do. We, we, compl we are completely against this concrete plant. So um, thank you for your time and, and listening to, to my argument. Thank you. <coughs> Steve Tomanchek. Uh, good evening, Steve Tomanchek. I'm a resident of Lake Forest. I'm not a tier one. I'm about 750 feet away from the concrete batch plant where it's gonna be. And unfortunately, I think the reason why we're all here and going through these meetings is zoning hadn't been changed in 40 years. So a lot has changed in that area in 40 years and it's unfortunate that the city or the powers that be have not kept up with that or people hadn't raised their hand or, or seen what's going on out there. Nobody's against progress. I mean, there's a lot that's going on out in the East End. There are plenty of other places that are not far from where this concrete batch plant is gonna be. That would be fine. That is away from that many people that will be affected. And there's a bunch of kids down there. Um, you know, there's. That's the, the fact of the matter. And I've spoken to other neighbors further down the hill, as he was saying, and they have to go out and get a blower and blow off this dust that's already been created. I've got a video of this from October 19th, and I was shocked because I washed them. I got a black car. I washed the car on the 18th, and I go out the next morning, and it's covered. And I'm like, well, where did all this come from? And they were moving dirt. And I've got a bunch of trees that would block that, and I know they're going to monitor it and filter it and those kind of things. But just that in itself, all the particulate that was going on once they were moving this matter has already affected 
people and kids. Who knows what who was breathing that stuff in? Um, and I kind of have some experience in, in concrete bash and concrete plants. I owned an ice company in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we delivered ice to concrete plants. They would put the con ice in concrete to meet, te meet temperature specs. To once they get for bridge pours and buildings, it's got to be a certain spec, or they can't pour it. So this plant can operate 24/7. Doesn't matter if it's 95 degrees or whatever. The dust in those plants, and I was physically at those places. The dust, in particular, that was kicked up by the trucks and not just the <coughs> disseminated from the plant itself, but it's a lot. I mean, if you've ever been to a concrete plant, just go and check one out or a batch plant or a cement plant. There's all kinds of stuff that, that's flying around. Um, I think that's about it. So the reason why we're here is I think that zoning hadn't been changed in 40 years. Nobody's looked at that and it's unfortunate. Um, there's some things that went on early on that nobody was notified. So I think y'all may be you know, know about that situation, but that's another, another thing. But um, just hope y'all will take what has been said here and really think about it. Uh, no problem with progress. It's just right there you know, with all these people that are around. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate what you did. Thank you. We have no more raised hands virtually. Well, we will take a, let's say, 15 minute recess to have other folks given the opportunity to join. Um, so we'll go in recess for 15 minutes. Mr. Gary, do we have anybody who has joined us in the interim? Um, I'm not sure if there are any new names on there. <laughs> Uh, if we have any new virtual attendees, we are reconvening the hearing. You're welcome to raise your hand. You'll find that next to your name in the attendee list if you wish to make a comment at this hearing. Once again, if you're attending virtually and have not spoken yet and would like to, please raise your hand. You can find that function next to your name in the attendee list. Would you try one more time for the gentleman yes. we had a difficulty connecting with? Mr. Clifton, trying one more time. You had your hand raised at the beginning of the meeting and we were unable to hear you. You are unmuted now. Uh, you are welcome to make a comment. I apologize. It sounds like we're still having difficulty. If you're trying to speak, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm unable to send him a direct message. Or anybody else registered to speak. Uh, would a representative from Sunshine Industries uh, Ready Mix like to respond to any of the comments made today? Uh, oh. We do have a another person who'd like okay. to. We have two hands now. Uh, Alex, I am working on unmuting you. I don't have a last name. Alex, if you would, please give us your first and last name for the record, and you're unmuted and able to speak now. Alex, we are unable to hear you either. I apologize for having technical difficulties. Oh, I believe you just muted yourself. Unmuted you again. Give it one more try, Alex. Can they respond in the chat? 
they are welcome to send a message. If anybody is unable to speak, send me a message directly in the chat. I cannot respond to somebody until they have sent me a message directly for, for whatever reason. But you're welcome to send me a message or email air at louisvilleky.gov. It may help if you give them instructions on the settings. Um, I had to do that for myself. If they go to unmute and click on settings, it's their computer settings microphone that uh, has to be adjusted. Thank you, Mr. White. Mm -hmm. So if you've heard that, Alex, if you're able to hear us, it may be the computer settings on your end. We'll come back to you in just a moment. We have another raised hand. All right, Tyler, Tyler Reynolds, I'm going to make you a panelist. If you are able, you're welcome to turn on your video. I will unmute you. Oh. Okay, you're welcome to speak when you're ready, Mr. Reynolds. Yeah, sorry I'm late to the party. I just wanted to echo some of the objections that you heard here tonight. I've got a son who attends daycare building kids, which is up stream from where this plant is supposed to be built. Um, I was at the church meeting uh, a few weeks ago where they were talking about monitoring stations. And and I apologize, this has already been dealt with tonight. But what I recall was the, low, the closest monitoring station was at Cannons Lane. And so I understand that you guys look at the EPA guidelines and you're going to follow the EPA guidelines as whether or not you're going to green light this plan or not. So I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion from where I'm sitting. So I'd like to know who's going to monitor this if you guys do decide to approve this. If you guys are using the Cannons Lane monitoring system, that's nowhere near where this is going to pollute and the health issues that are going to come in place. So I would advocate that if you guys are on board with doing this, that somebody petition to have a monitoring station placed somewhere near in this east end to monitor the air quality. Otherwise, I mean, what are you guys green lighting? You don't even know. So with that, you know, I vehemently object to that. I'm a resident of Lake Forest, and I just think this isn't great for the community, and I leave it to your all's discretion. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will try. Uh, Alex, one more time. Byron, while you're doing that, Mr. Clifton has indicated that he logged in to listen only. He does not have a microphone on his computer. Thank you, Rachel. Alex, I've unmuted you one more time to see if we can <coughs> hear you. Uh, Anybody who is unable to hear us, just a reminder, you can also submit written comments at air permits at globalky.gov. So if you're not able to get through to us, feel free to submit comments in writing, or even if you are, feel free either way. We're still unable to hear Alex, sorry. No others. No other raised hands. All right. Well, let me come back to uh, a representative from Sunshine Industries Ready Mix that they would like to make a comment um, in response to comments. Please do so at this time. Are there any board members who are on um, the video teleconference? We have Ms. Joe White present with us. Okay. Are there any questions from board members tonight? No questions. I don't have a question really. I I just don't uh I and this is not their purview. So the planning commission has already so what was it zoned for before and then the planning commission 
since 1982, it's my understanding that the property has been zoned for industrial use. I believe it's M3 is its designation. And so no zoning change was necessary in this case. It was reviewed by a development review committee. And then with modifications made to the proposal, it was subsequently reviewed again by the full planning commission. That public hearing took place last Thursday. And so when they applied for the permit, it was based on the original plans or the revised uh, plan? Matt? The permit we have out for notice right now is based on the revised smaller facility. And that is after addressing some of the community concerns. I believe that was their attempt. We will leave this hearing open until 730. Um, if anybody joins, obviously we will accommodate that. Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I got you. Please repeat so your name. So I'm Dane, Dane Mattingly. Um, you all might, the attorneys might know more about this, Sean. Uh, Same thing, M2 to M3, back then. Let's go. All right. So uh, what I was told, and I, I probably shouldn't be up here talking about this, but it was originally M2, and then Rogers Group, there's a, there's a rock quarry that sits on their side of it that there was supposed to be a preliminary, like a short-term change from M2 to M3. And then after, for whatever reason they did it, they were supposed to go back to M2. It was never supposed to be permanently M3. That's all I'm gonna say. There's more things, I probably shouldn't have said that, but there's more things to it that I'm gonna let them say if they want to. But I just wanted you all to know that it's not supposed to be M3. Thank you. Oh, we question. do have one more hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, doctor. Okay. So we know PM particulate matters, but what would be the size of dirt? So because that is going to be a reflection of what is there at this time with what they're doing construction wise. Right. So their construction operations would be subject to our general nuisance rule. That would be regulation 1.14. Typically with crustal materials, you're going to find primarily PM10, but there may be some PM fines as well. With respect to the project, and I ask that my engineering colleagues correct me on this, I want to be clear that the 25 ton limit is inclusive of all types of particulate matter. So there is not a 25 ton limit for PM, a 25 ton limit for PM10, or a PM a 25 ton limit for PM 2.5. It is inclusive of those types. And that 25 ton limit, which we use solely to determine whether or not the facility is major and subject to Title V or requires a limit. I believe that Ms. Hosey described the company's potential emissions from their operations. And Shannon, if you could again remind folks what the potential oper operational emissions are. Yeah, the potential emission, that's if they're running the plant nonstop all, all time, like just going full force, it would be um, 6.2 tons per year, potentially. Now that's like at full capacity nonstop. We have a raised hand that was up first, and I think we'll return to the audience. Um, Mr. Beery? What is 
Stephanie, you're a panelist again, and I'm unmuting you if you have something additional to say. Hi. Um, I apologize. This is Kara Beery. My husband and I are both watching from um, a computer remotely. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to speak to the fact that we already have the Rogers Group, the Rock Quarry in our area, um, and Louisville Paving just a short ways down the road off of Aiken. Um, and I implore you all to consider that when making this decision, how much more we're putting into the area that's already there. It's terrifying. As my husband mentioned earlier, I'm not going to be able to take my son outside anymore. And I apologize for getting emotional, but please consider that we are real people who can't, some of us can't move. Um, we are where we are. To speak to the economy, that doesn't really matter here. Um, I understand that this is an air pollution control meeting, but we already have so much in the area and it's terrifying that we're considering adding just that much more. Um, again, I apologize for being emotional. Thank you all for hearing all of us out. It's obviously a very emotional matter for all of us because it, it has to do with our kids. Um, and there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids nearby that this will affect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to worry about myself. I'm sorry. I should have deferred to Chair Sullivan before uh, letting somebody speak for a second time. That's your discretion. Uh, I'm fine with that. We have no other virtual hands. <clears throat> Please check your name. My name is Charles Bertalan, and I am a resident and homeowner in Lake Forest. I am also a degreed chemical engineer with 30 plus years of corporate experience. And I guess I'd like a clarification of something right now. Because I am looking at the form AP100A that is asking for a requested limit of 25 tons per category, PM, PM10, and PM2.5. So am I misreading this form? And they're asking for only 25 tons because it appears that they're asking for 75 tons. The yeah, purpose of a hearing is to take comment. Okay. Uh, I think at another point we could certainly in our written responses, but I hopefully before then we can clarify that a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Bird again, may I make one suggestion? And that is if we put more monitoring stations out there, because the wind generally is from the west, southwest, and uh, then sometimes it moves around and comes in from the northwest. If you had a monitoring device, maybe over in front of the church and one by Oakhurst and one down by St. Mary's, you would be able to capture all of the wind directions of, for particulate matter coming off of the road and off of the plant. And uh, don't know how expensive those things are, who buys them, what the logistics of putting them up would be, but that would be my suggestion to the Air Pollution Control Board, because I think that would be something that would come under your direct purveyance and oversight. And. Uh, if this thing goes forward, I, I, I would much prefer it didn't go forward for obvious reasons. But if it does go forward, that you, I mean, Cat Cannon's Lane is, is, is way opposite direction of prevailing wind. So you would never get anything from there that happened out in the, uh, out in the east end out there. But if you, if you put those monitors there, you would at least have a pretty good, um, baseline and continuum of monitoring of what the pollution was. Thanks. Thank you. Have Alex virtually, I think they have raised their hand again. Give them one more try. Alex, if you're able hey. to hear us. There you go. We hey. can hear you now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please give us your um, full name. Okay, so do I just need to say my name? 
Yes, please. Okay, so yeah, Alex Casabella, I live on Oakhurst Road, um, right, uh, right across from Aiken and where the proposed concrete plant um, will be built. And I just, um, I guess I just kind of want to echo and I guess, like you guys said, this is just a place to make comments. Um, so my understanding is my questions will not be answered right now, but um, have you guys been out and tested our air quality recently? Um, as um, someone just stated, we are already surrounded by so, mi so much industrial um, <laughs> just pollution and with a quarry, I mean, I can't even get my car washed because my car is constantly just covered in dust and just grime. And so I guess I'm just kind of wondering, hey, have you guys, when's the last time our air has been tested out this way? Um, and then also to just kind of echo, if for some reason the concrete plant does go through, I too would love more information on um, these air quality control um, stations or whatever is set up at Cannons Lane on what those look like, where they could be placed. And I think like what the man just shared, having them placed in multiple sites, I think would be wonderful. Um, and then just another statement is, have any of you guys been out? Like, have you guys seen, have you driven by to see where this site is going to be? Um, have you seen the neighborhood? Have you seen the homes? Have you seen the school? Have you seen St. Mary's, um, the church, all these um, residential places filled with children and how close it truly is to where this plant is proposed to be. So, thank you. Thank you. One more. Thank you so much. I, I ran out of time, so I, I just want to make a few more points. Um, based on my experience, these dust collectors will fail. They will fail at some point in time. And Oh, my name is Steve Plass again. So these dust collectors will fail. And by looking at the documentation, I think this is what's on them. This is a magna helix gauge. What I'm recommending is a transmitter. And this gives 24 seven real time data to the state of the art control system that's being built. This will allow for normal conditions, alarm conditions and shutdown conditions to be established. So if as requested in application 100J, it is a manual observation once a day. That means when the dust collectors fail, they can potentially admit for a 24 hour period before they're caught. That makes them extremely dangerous to the surrounding population. By putting transmitters on, we can catch a failure before it happens. And that's why they're so important. And so, if the, again, if the plant is built, which it seems like it's going to be, our job is to make it as safe as possible. And this is a significant step forward. I've looked on the internet, the transmitter costs about $2,500. And so, it, I don't think it's overly onerous on the applicant to make the change. And the time to make the change is while the plant is being built. You don't wanna make this change when the plant comes to the site. So you want, I think it's Vince Hagen that's building the plant. You want this modification made by the fabricator, by the dust collector provider before the unit actually gets to the field. Then it becomes more expensive, it becomes more costly. So I hope you give that serious consideration. And thank you for your time. And thank everybody for attending tonight. Uh, the district will be preparing a response to comments document that includes a response to the oral and written uh, comments made. And again, that's closes through open public. comment through tomorrow. Right. Public comment period will end tomorrow, November the 11th. Uh, that document will be made available at the time the district makes a decision on the draft permit. And there being no other comments or questions, uh, this public hearing is adjourned. Thanks again for attending.